Hi guys, I'm Chasing Lamely and today we start something brand new, exciting and a little bit experimental on the channel. This is a beginner's guide to football manager. A couple of things before we just get straight into it. First, this is a beginner's guide but if you've been playing for a while you might learn a thing or two, who knows. And also, although this is made on FM21, they all probably carry over for at least the next couple of FMs. You know, they don't, they don't tend to tweak a lot under the hood year to year so I suspect it's probably going to carry over for a little while. Today we are starting at the beginning, day one on the job. Let's get into it and I'll show you a little bit of a, a little bit of a way around from an old Nick experienced head here. So when you start yourself a new game of FM you'll probably find yourself on the inbox screen. This isn't what your inbox will look like but I am um, four seasons in now. I'm just starting the fourth season. This is the new club we've just joined Leeds in our one of our main saves on the channel after leaving Sunderland. But it felt like a good time to show you around. So, you will have some things in here about tactics and things. You can obviously go through those one by one. That's not a problem. You will, we, you'll get the feel for things. That's what they're there for. But you've joined a new club. I would ex I recommend if you are a new player, the first thing you do is spend some time just flicking through these tabs on the left-hand side. They're all pretty self-explanatory. And they all have sub menus, and this is a little trick that I think a lot of even experienced FM players don't don't really know. If you find any one of these tabs and you right click on them, it gives you pop ups that take you to the directly to the screen you're looking for. So if you're looking at transfers, you want to look at say your transfer history, right click straight into transfer history. There's a good little trick for you, and it should take you straight in. Although we're being a little bit slow today, you see we've gone straight in. Happy days, boom, done. That's that's good knowledge. But it's your first day on the job, so. Where do you need to go first? My recommendation you've just taken over is to take a look first at the club vision screen. Now the club vision screen tells you what the board expects of you. And this is kind of your mission statement. This is kind of what you're looking for on the job as you go through. So at Leeds they want us to play entertaining football and as you hover over it tells you what that means. So if, or you can wait here on the little eye icon. It says TV is to play expansive and attractive football to keep the fans entertained. It wants to play attacking football, which, you know, high goals to games, shots to games, ratio, that's, you know, pretty, pretty self-explanatory if you've watched any football at all. But if you don't know, it will tell you. We also need to develop young players, we need to sign under 23 players, make the most of set pieces, which is a tactical thing that I'll go to, into at another stage, I suspect. Then you've got the, the five-year plan, because the club culture tells you, you know, what they expect essentially from you, no matter how long you're there. Your five-year plan, they need to grow the, us to grow the club's reputation, sign young players to develop for a profit, work within the wage budget, sign players to sell for a profit, and a minimum three-year contract for first-team players. And then the expectation for this season is that we finish mid-table. So now we know what we're expected to do, this is a really good time to start thinking about what we're going to do tactically. So for entertaining football, for example, I'm probably going to want to play something attacking and you know, lots of passing, lots of movement. So we're going to go very quickly into the tactics screen. Now when you go into the tactics screen, you'll see this choose a tactical style menu. It's recommending vertical tiki taka, direct counter attack and catenazio for us as, as those things that we should be looking to do. We're going to go through how these will relate to things you might find in that club vision screen. So for example, control possession will, as it suggests, control possession. You do get asked to play a possession based game occasionally. The gig and press and ticky tackers will help with that entertaining style. They're quite entertaining styles of football. Wing play route one, they're both very attacking. Sometimes you get asked to counter attack, and obviously those two fluid counter attacks, they're pretty strong for that. And then sometimes you're asked to play defensively solid football, which is where Catanaccio and Park the Bus come in. And then if you click on any of these styles, so pretend we're going to go for a vertical ticky tacker, I don't know what we're going to do with this team yet. But you can choose formation and it will recommend that you do a particular formation. In this case, the 4-3-3 defensive midfielder wide. So that's a good starting point. But we'll, we'll go away from that for just a second because, you know, this, like I said, this isn't a tactical video. Next thing you need to do is have a look at your finances. Because this is going to be kind of what dictates what you can do with the club. So we have £7 million to spend in the Premier League, which is not a lot of money. It is, however, because the old manager brought in a bunch of players for the end of the season and a lot of them are not terribly good so we spent quite a lot of my money which is a problem and also our wage budget you can see our wage budget is 1,394,000 we're currently spending 
1,333,000, which means Quick Maths have got about 61,000 a week to spend. Committed spending is going to be really looking at, which means we've probably got a little bit more to spend. It's about 80,000, 90,000 to spend. Either way, it's not a lot of money. We don't have a lot of leeway. So we're going to look at the squad from here. The squad is important. Just take a quick look. It's best to order them by ability. For players who are at lower clubs, I really don't recommend that you look at the star ratings too much because they're dependent on your assistant manager's judging player ability thing. But if you are completely new to the game, they will be really important for you. They're going to be things that really help you just to understand where your squad is at. And you can see these are our big players like Phillips, Koch and Rodrigo, Lorente, Stuart Dallas. There's quite a lot in there. So... In this instance, because the board have asked us to play attacking football, I'm going to be looking up for very specific stats to decide where the players stay. First, we're going to start in the attacking thing, because that's going to tell us what we can do going forward. And obviously, Robin Koch is an offender. We don't expect him to have big attacking stats. But one thing you're going to want with something that requires uh, entertaining football and requires attacking football is you're going to be wanting to look at the vision score. So Diego Lorente doesn't really provide anything but defending. He's a player that's probably expendable. His passing is fairly decent, but he's probably expendable. Same with his flair. Koch as well. Obviously, as a defender, as I said, his flair, not super important. But keep an eye on stuff like that. And these are going to be kind of the things you want to look at. So if we order things by, say, vision, these players down here, Sarachi and Urzi and Torrente, are they going to become necessary? Becomes an immediate question you have to ask. Spend the time. Look at the actual player stats. He's a winger who doesn't really do great with the seeing the pass, can cross, can dribble, has the flair, he's still a guy you want to keep around, even though he doesn't. he's not necessarily going to create a lot, he might be a guy you want to keep around. Whereas you've got a guy like Diego Llorente, who, if you're going to build from the back, is he going to find that pass you need to really start that movement off? And that's a thing you kind of have to think through. The other thing I would look at when looking at attacking football, and it's not annoyingly on the attacking screen, it's under the physical screen, is I would take a good look at the pace of your players. Because, especially at this level, and at any level really, if you're going to play attacking football, you need to have faster players near the team. Now at this level, a good, quick player is probably around a 14, 50. Anything below that is probably a bit slow. So there's a whole bunch of players here. You can see that maybe, maybe we wouldn't keep. Obviously the goalkeepers are relevant because they don't do a lot of running. But these, these are things you're going to need to keep an eye on. Maybe think... How quickly can I turn turn defence into attack? That's going to be something you want to look at very, very keenly. But I won't go into just too quickly how to assess your players. It's Like I said, you can use the star ratings. You can use each player. If you click onto them, we'll go into Tinge by here. If you go into your coach report, you'll get a full breakdown of what they do well, what they do badly. And you can see here, Tinge Edvai does not do a lot badly. It's got two things there that he does badly. It's considered a good player for most Premier League sides. I know... I can trust my staff at this level because I know they've got good abilities to judge players. That's very much what we're looking for. So the next group we're going to look at is the team report. Now I've picked a tactic. If you don't pick a tactic, there'll be nothing here. This is what your assistant manager thinks your best team is using the tactic you've selected. I'm going to use the 4-4-2 Tiki Taka. Just an example that I've been using to get Sunderland up the leagues. And you can see here where there's weaknesses. Now for me, anyone less than three stars... As a rule, obviously look into their stats, see how that shakes out in real terms. But anyone under three stars generally needs to be upgraded or replaced, which is important. But you, all these reports here, so you've got an analyst report here that tells you your general overall performance of the team. The green is the Premier League average, the blue is our record, and you can see we are way down on goals a game, on expected goals, that we're not creating enough chances. Uh, we're not far behind on goals conceded per game, but we could probably use conceding a few less and shots per game. Like this team's real problem is creating goals. That's something you need to kind of be aware of whenever you take over a new club. If you have this data available, make sure you know what the club's weaknesses are. We know we can keep the ball, we know we can tackle, we know when we do shoot it's usually on target. But there's a lot of stuff here that we're not doing terribly well. This is, that's where I need to focus things. It's, this team's focus essentially just needs to be on finding goals. So if we go into the assistant report here, this is more or less the same sheet with individual players with a coach report, but this is for your entire squad. So you can look at the things you do well, and this may help sort of guide what you do tactically. For example, we've got players who are good in the air, goalkeepers that are good in the air. That means we're fairly secure defensively. We've got a lot of young players coming through who might turn something special. We know we're a threat from outside the box, which is amazing. 
we know this through ball has been great, we know we have a good goal scorer, however I'll go into that in just a second because that's the next stage we're going to look at before we make any kind of transfer decisions. We know we've got some good options in defence, it tells us we've got some good options in goal, we have got good options at defensive midfielder as well, and then the yellow ones are the ones where we're okay but we could improve, so our goalkeeper again getting that shout out as being quite good. We're getting a lot of information about how we finished the game quite late, I mean the player's fitness is pretty good. We've got apparently some good creativity, although the the stats in the assistant, re the analyst report, sorry, and that's why you have to go and look at everything. Don't bear that out, and there is some wage budget there to go, and we're slightly above average in terms of a squad, according to our assistant manager. But we do have these weaknesses, like there's not a lot of depth in the first team. There's no players who are good in the air, which is something we'll look to look at very, very closely. And again, we're gonna sh I'll show you some things that will help you work that out. We have no good free kick takers we don't have um, we've got no one in the air to put the ball towards anyway there's a lack of leadership so we're probably going to need to sign a captain these things they'll all get kind of give you that good advice like the squad can't finish so we're going to need someone who can finish that's going to be important we don't have many players with good flair that's a problem because we want to play entertaining football just look at these things and have a have a go through with your own squad just see what you see and then we'll think about how you address those things the next thing we'll look at is the squad depth which Generally speaking, takes that formation you've got, it organises your players by who is the top five players in that position. And like I said, anyone who's not going to be top three probably in any position, and when I say top three in any position, obviously central midfielders are looking top six, but top three in general, you probably want to move on because they're probably wasting time and or wasting space in the squad unless you've got big, a, you know, a big potential player there you can develop. Kiko Casillas, for example. He would be someone I was looking to move on if he wasn't about to retire. That's an important thing to have that awareness of. Going back to the analyst report, the other screen you might want to look at, and you can find at the bottom of this tab here, is the comparison. Now this compares your squad to every other squad in the division you're in, which is incredibly useful for seeing where your weaknesses are when compared to those opponents you expect to come up against. For example, our players are at below average height. It's only an inch, I'm not going to worry too much. But they're of below average height. They are of below average weight as well, which hopefully will pop up in just a second. There we go. So we're three kilos under the highest. We are a kilo on average or under the average. That means that there's probably not quite not a lot of strength in that team, which is going to be a weakness defensively. International caps don't need to worry so much. Same with youth caps, because you can have some great players who just aren't getting capped for whatever reason. Our average player wage, well below the league average, which is really good. That means we are, in theory at least, not overspending ourselves, overextending ourselves, but our average player value is also below the average, which maybe means that we're not we're not quite having the quality of players. These are all good things to have, but then we go to all positions and it starts looking at those more core attributes that you might want to worry about. So we are below average in decision making, that's something we need to focus on. We are below average in passing. We're above average in first touch, which means we're great when we get the ball, but we need to do something with it. We are well, well below average on strength. I mean, the average strength in this league is 11.9. We are at an 11.12. And the best is a whole point and a half on average above what we have at Arsenal, which confirms my suspicions from earlier that we didn't have a lot of strength in the squad. Probably going to want some more physical players when we make some transfers. We want some more physical players to come in. We've got, then got teamwork, and again, our teamwork isn't great, and we are below average, we're ranked 17th in the Premier League, so we're among the worst for teamwork. And that's going to really, you know, it's going to play into how your build-up play goes, it's going to play into how hard they fight back when they are behind. And again, you look at leadership, 9.12 is ours, we're 19th in leadership, we are not quite the worst, because Sunderland, who we just left, are the worst, um, but we're also... Well, a whole point below the average, and we're two points below the best, and that's two and a half points below the best. That's going to be information we need to look at. We we need we need some leaders in the squad. And aggression, I won't worry really too much about aggression. You don't want to be the highest. You don't want to be the lowest. You you want to be somewhere around a ten. So that's perfectly acceptable. We we'll look at the goalkeepers, and for these ones, for the positional based ones, you probably want to only show the players who will play in those positions. So you can see for goalkeepers, okay, we're down on reflexes. Command of the area we're doing very badly at, but Manchester United are below us. And for agility we're doing well below average. But everything else we're kind of around average or we're 
Well, I mean, we're well above average for aerial ability. We're above above average for handling. I don't know where we would figure in the handling stats. We're I mean, we're apparently bang average. <laughs> apparently, um, but there we go. We're tenth. Just th these are things to pay attention to. And again, you can go through all of your positions by position. Physicals are important to pay attention to because you don't want your team getting out muscle, which we know we have a strength problem. But also here, look at things like the pace. If you're going to play attacking football. You want to be above average for pace. You don't want to be just hovering around the average for pace. You want to be above average for acceleration. You want to be probably above average for agility as well, because that's going to be sort of reaction times and things. Balance is how much your players are going to stay on their feet. Fitness, you always want to be in the top half, well in the top half. When you go into pre-season, I'll, I'll cover this in training in just a second. When you go into pre-season, work on that fitness for sure. Looking at mentals as well, you can see... What, the two ones I'd say here are the most key, or the three I'd say most key, key here are determination, because determination dictates how well your young players will develop above all else, it also sort of dictates how hard they'll work. Leadership dictates how well they are at firing each other, how good they are at firing each other up on the pitch. And teamwork, again, teamwork and work, I guess, kind of go hand in hand, because they are, they're what kind of is that drive in your team. And then finally, you look at technicals and technicals. Like I said, we're, we're looking to entertain here. That's what we're looking for. So for technicals, we're probably going to look at things like passing, which we should be better at. We're behind in heading, which we knew. Crossing as well, which is going to be chance creation and finishing at this level. If you can't finish, you're going to struggle. That's always going to be the way. But let's go from there. Let's go into the next thing you need to look at on day one, which for me is training. Make sure you do this on day one. So we're on our training calendar here, and usually for training, what I would say to you is leave your, especially when you're new to the game, leave your uh, assistant manager in charge of this, because generally speaking, they'll do a good job, at least until you understand what's going on under the hood. But what I will say is that for pre-season, you have these pre-season presets for light early, normal early, you'll get a recommendation. Uh, for me, take a look at these, and always look at the, the list on the right-hand side here. So what we're looking to do is build sharpness, but we're also looking to build fitness, we're looking to build team condition, and those things are going to be quite important. So try and stay somewhere between normal and heavy. You can do tactical or technical if you really feel like you've got a super fit squad, do that. I mean, tactical-wise as well, you can train for a particular tactic. So if I want to play a tiki attacker, we can work towards that. We can, of course, go for boot counts, which will work heavily on people's conditioning and fitness. And training style, again, just take a look at these things. Go through them all. Physical is usually a good bet here because we just we want to get these players as fit as we possibly can. Try and get as much endurance and quickness and resistance in there as you can pre-season. Try and really bump up the fitness of your players as much as you can without over-pushing them. Because the fitter they are on day one, the fitter they'll be by the end of the season, the more the more you'll find yourself scoring late goals rather than conceding late goals. And that's kind of important as well to pay attention to. So where are we going next, you might be asking. Next, we're going to the development centre. You remember we have to develop young players. That's important. But you also have to take a look at this from a kind of pragmatic, long-term view. Start with your under-23s, look at the potential ratings. Don't, I mean, obviously first take a look at the ability ratings, the current ability ratings. If anyone in any of your underage squads is three-star or above, promote them. Promote them and play them. Otherwise, look at your potential. You've got players who are... What, yellow stars mean almost guaranteed potential, so at the moment four-star potential is guaranteed. They're the five is sort of potential potential, that's how much better they could become. If they are grey, that's potentially like here for Rob Green. Grey means their current ability in terms of your youth team. If they're not yellow, they're not good enough to play anywhere near the first team. If any of these are grey, bin that player. <laughs> bin that player immediately. Then you look at things like that, and frankly, everyone from sort of here down, the two and a half star down a potential ability, they can go. These are players who, if their contracts aren't going to expire, even if their contracts are going to expire, just let them go. Just let them go. Just add them to your, your unwanted list. I'm going to go through and do this for the main save it, you know, in a second anyway. But add them to your unwanted list. Get a price for them. Get them released. Get them gone. Just don't have them in your squad. With these guys, honestly, maybe think about selling them as well, the three-star ones, because unless they're going to get there very soon. Like, Ian Carlo Paveda might make himself to a three-star player this season. He might come back from the summer break a three-star player. If he does, then we'll keep him around, and if he doesn't, we get rid of him. 
but the vast majority of this this squad, or say the vast majority, sort of the bottom half of what you can see on your screen here, will go for sure. And then you look at the under 18s, and this is important as well, by the way, if you're a small club. If you're a small club, say you're in the conference, you cannot afford. I cannot say this loudly enough. I cannot say this enough in any way enough. You cannot afford to hoard players who aren't going to make it. These guys here, they're never going to make it. I can afford to hoard them, but what's the point? What is the point in me keeping these players? They're not going to make it. I can immediately just offer. I'd always offer them out for transfer first, just to see if you get any bites. But don't don't fear releasing them. Honestly, don't fear releasing them. Just let them go. I mean, if you look at these players here, I, we can do a quick role play. There's 20 players there. They're all earning, earning 150 quid a week. That's £3,000 every week you're spending on players you will not use, ever. They'll never appear in your first team. Even the best of them, Kyle McCulloch, you look at this guy, okay, he's got some good bravery and determination stats, he's going to reach to maybe three-star potential, but his ceiling is rubbish. His ceiling is rubbish, he's got nothing. If, you, if you're looking at this, especially like, say from the point of view of being a Premier League team, with, and you've not played around with any colours for attributes, if he doesn't have five attributes in yellow in each column, get rid of him. Just get rid. He's doing nothing for you. He's doing absolutely nothing for you. That's that's worth bearing in mind as well. Next up, when you're looking at your transfer business, look at team dynamics, and especially this pay, this sort of box here, the issues box. So you've got Rodrigo here. He wants to leave because he wants to play in the Champions League. He's worth twenty-two million pound. He's earning a hundred grand a week. He's already wanted by other clubs. He's probably at 32, not a player I'm going to be looking to do anything with, to be honest, because he's too old for what I want. He's only had 30 goals in 108 games, I mean, it's a goal every three or four games. He's not hes not going to score a lot of goals for me. He's not someone I'm, I'm looking at thinking, this is, this is my point man up top. If he wants to go and play in the Champions League, let him go. You'll see other things down here, be things like wants a new contract, unhappy at the way they've been treated, unhappy for whatever reason. If the unhappiness is in the red, just get rid of them. You're never going to make them happy, and I promise you, just get rid of them. If it's in the blue, you could fix that, but we're going to let Rodrigo go. That's that's not a problem here. These things as well, they're important at the top. The team cohesion, you want this to be as good as possible. The better they, the players get on, the more cohesive a unit they are, the more they'll play for each other, the harder they'll work for each other. The atmosphere, again, try and keep that good. That means that the number of players who are unhappy is at the absolute minimum, and that's very, very much important. But also look at things like this, where it says there are many contrasting personalities through the club. You probably want to make sure that there aren't that many contrasting personalities. Try and have a lot of players who are of a very similar mindset, who are pulling in the same direction. Pay attention to anything that is yellow, anything that is red in these things, because you can probably fix them. Managerial of sport, we're going to over a number of players. You have a good reputation compared to the players at the moment. We've still got average and most importantly red managerial support results will get up. results in the way you treat your players will get up take a look at the hierarchy screen as well that will tell you who your leaders are so the leaders in this squad are Stuart Dallas, Calvin Phillips and Jamie Shackleton those are guys that unless they're reaching the end of their career you get a massive offer for you don't want to get rid of because it will utterly destroy utterly destroy your team your dressing room atmosphere it will definitely, definitely not help your your dressing room atmosphere. Same with your highly influential players. The influential ones, not so much. Other players, kick them around. It doesn't matter. No one cares. The social group as well is important to look at. You, here we've got our social group. One social group. You might find yourself with two or three social groups. It tells you why they're in that social group. It's usually because they've been together for a while or they speak the same language, they come from the same country, they're the same age. It's generally things like that that will put them in social groups. But bear in mind, if you upset a key player, so uh, imagine this was three different social groups, and we had Dallas, Phillips, and Shackleton each in a different social group. Don't upset them because it upsets everyone else in that social group. And suddenly you can find yourself with half or even a third of your squad that does not want to play. The happiness screen as well, important to look at. It breaks down into morale, training, treatment, club, management, playing time, and overall happiness. So... We know that we've got a few players who are dissatisfied with the club. For example, Calvin Phillips wants to know whether he should be playing at a bigger club. Messlier wants to know if he should be playing for a bigger club. We've got a few players here considering whether or not they should be playing for a bigger club. Keep an eye on these. You don't want these concerns to be big. And you want to look at these players first when you're thinking, about, do I keep them? 
do I let them go? For example, Rafinha, I know, is a player that doesn't really fit my system. If he's already thinking about how he wants to move on, he wants to go play for a bigger club, see if you, he's worth 24 million. If I can get 50 million for him, if I can get 40 million for him, well, let him go because I don't want him unhappy. He doesn't really fit into my system. And yes, he's a good player, but I don't think he's going to be a player that's around more than a season anyway. We'll just get rid of him while we can, make the money. That's, that's how you have to look at these things. You have to be a bit ruthless. Your code of conduct, it will appear here. It tells you how, what the fines are, the punishments are for things like getting sent off, missing training, etc. Generally speaking, leave that to your assistant manager because if you get that wrong, you'll upset the players and you'll do a team meeting pretty quickly. Just say nice things. Just say nice things. Be as humble as you can and say nice things. That's the best advice I can give you. Be humble. Say nice things. Now the next place you want to look is staff. And I'm, I'm not going to do, any, do much tinkering with the staff because I've brought a lot of my staff. Like these gaps here, you can see with the coaches, with the recruitment team. I have people coming with me from Sunderland to fill those gaps. They're just waiting for work permits. But it, this, is, this is probably a good time for this example. So you can have a look at your coaching team. It will give you a general overview of the coaching team over here, the comparison screen. And again, it's just like the other comparison screen with the squad. It tells you where you are on average and compared to the rest of the thing. You want these to be yellow. They go yellow when you are the highest average. Once my new coaching staff comes in, once my coaching staff comes in from Sunderland, they were the best coaching staff in the Premier League. The guys I'm bringing with me will put those back up but try and replace them. In terms of importance, in terms of finding your staff, I strongly recommend you follow, especially with coaches, you follow a particularly set order. So I'll just, uh, just clear that very quickly so I can show you. I'll show you from scratch. So if you go to your new screen, or to your new search screen, sorry, say you're looking for an assistant manager, always pick the staff role of the assistant manager. That tells you if they're interested in being your assistant manager. And next, do an attributes pick. Highlight key attributes for the assistant manager and just select OK. You will, nine times out of ten, find nobody, but we are finding people. If I was in the market for an assistant manager, I know now that Pablo Manusovic and Davide Ancelotti are both good enough to be that assistant manager. And once I click on the players, I can click down here on the staff role and it will highlight whatever staff role I should be giving it. And it will tell you what, how good they are. So Davide Ancelotti, if I needed an assistant manager would absolutely be my guy for a fact because he's good he's that good obviously the lower levels you're down the more you've got to adjust your expectations you can use these plus and minus screens to drop down so you might want to drop down sort of an eight or a nine if you're in league two or the conference you, you'll figure out the drill fairly quickly but we're looking for now we're looking at coaches and we're going to just we're just going to clear this because coaches are the, by far the easiest things to recruit when you join a club there are, there are priorities, so we're going to imagine for a second, we're not at Leeds United, we're going to imagine for a second we are with, say, Boreham Wood, because I can see them on screen, I know they are somewhere in the conference type leagues. The absolute first type of coach you want to work on is a fitness coach. Even before you hire an assistant manager, in fact, hire yourself a fitness coach, hire the best fitness coach you can. He will be responsible for making sure your players don't pick up injuries, for making sure they play the full 90 minutes, that above all else. It's, it's kind of like the old motor racing analogy where you can't win a race in the first corner, you have to be there on the last lap. It's exactly the same thing with football, you want to go to the 90th minute and to get your players to the 90th minute they need the best fitness coaching you can. The next thing I would be looking at is a goalkeeping coach. Get yourself a, the best goalkeeping coach you can handle, the best goalkeeping coach you can find because fitness and goalkeepers are the two things that require very specialist training, they require very, very specialist work. They're the ones you'll find players complaining about, not good enough fitness coach or not good enough goalkeeping coach. People will complain about those things. Get those two in the door first, because if your keepers are good, your defence is solid, if your fitness is good, your whole team is more solid than it would be. From there onwards, if you only have the two coaches you get at a smaller club, Try and fill everything else out with an assistant manager who's fairly good across the board. That can, you know, he may not have a 15 or a 20 in anything, but he might have a good solid set of 10s or 12s, or if you're lower down, 8s or 9s. Find the guy who's the best across the board and hire him as a coach, or as an assistant manager, but with an eye on coaching, and don't worry about the assistant manager attributes quite so much. Just focus on getting your coaching up to scratch. If you have more coaches, and you know, as you add a coach, Look for them in this order. The first I would suggest is looking for a defensive coach. Get that defense tight. Then get your attack tight after that. 
The next thing we look for is a technical coach because he's going to be the one that develops your player's actual skills on the field. A tactical coach will help get those tactical tweaks you make into play working better. And then finally look for a coach with good mentors. Don't worry about man management or youth too much unless you're looking for a youth coach or an assistant manager. Your mentors will be the guys who will keep your team absolutely focused and fired up and get them in that right mindset for the game. And that's kind of what you're looking for. So that's how I would approach the coaching stuff for sure. And the last thing I recommend you looking at, and it's kind of a tandem thing, is the competition screen. Because the competition screen, usually obviously this is at the end of a season, we're about to go between seasons, it will tell you what, you're, what competitions you're in and what you're expected to achieve. So here we were expected this season to finish mid-table. Obviously I wasn't in charge, I take no responsibility for this. So mid-table wasn't succeeding, you can see that you'll get a performance rating. That's my performance rating, I guarantee the last manager's was. Because they were supposed to finish ninth this season, according to the season preview, which you can find if you go into the league table. And again, look at the cups. Are you expected to just be competitive? That just means do what you like, hopefully you'll pick up a win. If you're expected to reach a particular round, make sure you reach that particular round. That's all fairly self-explanatory. And also, look at the schedule as well. Get an idea before you start the season what your schedule looks like. So obviously, this is the season just gone. Take a look at the teams you're playing in this first month. So if this is the season we're going into, they've said we should be looking for a top-half finish. I want to be looking at this first month's schedule. In fact, we'll take away... We'll just quickly... And this is a good thing to show you. We can take away all the cups and things, the competitions we don't want to see. Uh, I think it will let me take away friendlies as well. It won't. It's fine. So, it will, actually... My brain. It will. No competition. There we go. I don't know why that didn't register. So if you go just to the Premier League fixtures, say this is our first month on the job. We know we're playing Tottenham, Sunderland, Chelsea, Liverpool and Man United. Well, we know that as a team expected to finish mid-table, we know for a fact that Tottenham, Chelsea, Liverpool and United would be expected to finish above us. Which means that we're focusing on this Sunderland game where we would need a win for a fact that there's no excuses for that not being a win. Have a think about that game, maybe spend some time watching back Sunderland's first game of the season, see how they're playing after they've played, get a sense for how they work, gear yourself up towards that. But also, in the two weeks or so before this game against Tottenham, I would be hammering the defensive training. Because, okay, no one expects you to beat these sides, but if you can get four draws and a win here, that's already seven points on the table, and seven points from 15, admittedly, is less than half. But that's a, lot, that's a good haul of points from Tottenham, Chelsea, Liverpool and United. For you to be able to get four points is pretty strong. And then you go into the next month, you see this September thing. It's Leicester, Sheffield United and Norwich. I'd expect nine points from that as a mid-table side. I'd certainly expect a minimum of seven points, because obviously Leicester, they can be quite good when they want to be. But I'd be looking for a minimum of seven. Also, pay attention to when your derbies are happening. Because Sheffield United, as Leeds boss, you have to beat Sheffield United. And you have to try and beat United, Manchester United as well. But a draw there, the, the fans won't complain too much. But Sheffield United, you absolutely want to win. And the idea, the reason to get a balance of, an idea of the balance of when your fixtures are coming is, A, you know when you need your big guns, your best 11, absolutely firing all times. That first month, apart from maybe the Sunderland game, I would not be resting players. I would be using the players, the best players I have to the best of their ability right up until the Leicester game. Sheffield and Norwich, if you've got some players who are starting to look a bit tired, you know they've played a lot of football, it tells you they've had a heavy workload, drop them. Bring in, bring in some of the second string, then bring the first team back for Arsenal, drop them again for West Brom, for Newcastle, for Fulham. Bring, you know, rotate them, I should say, don't drop them entirely, rotate them, and then bring back their full-strength team for City, Maybe bring that full strength team back for Everton because they're going to be predicted to finish somewhere around you. And then you can rotate again for Brighton. You can probably rotate again for West Ham. Rotate for Villa for Sunderland again. And then we're back into that grind of we need the big guns. We need the first team, the strongest 11. Keep an eye on your schedule. Make sure you know who you're playing and when. Look for those opportunities to register or to rest your players. Look for those opportunities to blood young players as well. And the cups are really good for that. So, for example, look at this cup run. Huddersfield, they're a championship side. I'd expect to be playing maybe three or four young players in that squad. Palace, maybe not. And then Fleetwood, who are a couple of divisions below, absolutely stick your kids out. I don't even know if the old manager did that. He didn't. He went full strength that game. I'd have stuck a few kids out. I wouldn't have taken the risk. Then he played Man City in the FA Cup. And I would have been looking for a first team again. Same with United. Same with Newcastle. If you're playing a team on your own level, use that first team. If you're playing a team way below your level, 
play a few kids, rotate your team, rest players. It's really not that important. If you think you can win it with your sort of rotated second string side, use it. Just use it. Give your first team that day off. Give those younger players, those fringe players, the experience to prove maybe work their way into the first team. That's going to be really important. But I think that's pretty much everything I need to wrap up with you for this this kind of first episode. Apologies if it's gone a little bit long, but that you know, first day on the job can be quite difficult. We will make sure we wrap this up properly because that's always important. There we go. As I said, this was intended mostly for complete beginners. If you have been playing a while, let me know if there's anything you've learned from this or if there's something I missed, you think I missed. Leave it in the comments below just because people who watch the video then can look below. They can see there's a whole bunch of experienced FM players who have said, OK, you missed this. Maybe you keep an eye out for this. This is how I do it. It's a really good way to kind of start that conversation. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon at Chasing Lamely. That will, you know, I mean, it won't provide much FM content, but, you know, you can say hi, I, I guess. Don't forget to like and subscribe, because liking and subscribe means that when I continue this series, you'll see more videos in this series, they'll pop up. And if you ring the bell for notifications, as demonstrated by the magic graphic, which you will come to know and love, you'll see everything that goes up on the channel. Just hit the bell, select all, whenever anything pops up, whatever device you're using, it will pop up a thing on it, whether it's your, your desktop or your phone or whatever you're using. It will pop up a notification to say the next part of this video, this series has gone up or a new video has gone up on the channel or, you know, that kind of stuff. It's very straightforward. Anyway, guys, in the meantime, I have been Chasing Lamely. Thank you very much for watching. I'm sorry it's gone a little bit long, but it's the first episode and it's the day one thing for beginners. There is a lot to go through. But until next time, guys, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all very soon. Have a good one.